year. Uh, this series is co-sponsored uh, by the Medical Ethics Program and by the Global Health Initiative, which, uh, as you know, is directed by Kumi Olapati and by Shola Olapati, who joined the university uh, about a month ago. Shola Olapati. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, the goal of the Global Health Initiative is to improve health through education, research, and clinical programs that link the University of Chicago with partners uh, around the world. Uh, and since many academic disciplines contribute uh, to global health, uh, we hope that this seminar series uh, will introduce you to a fairly diverse group of faculty uh, as well as students uh, from around the university. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, we're in actually our 28th year, uh, that, that is the medical ethics program, uh, of holding a year-long seminar series like this. Uh, uh, I, I show you some of them uh, on, um, on, on these slides, but you won't be able to read them very well from the back. We started around 1982 or 83, and then uh, each year since then, we've had roughly 20 seminars. This year we'll have 25 seminars uh, that, that aim to link the university community, the broader university community, with the interests of the biological sciences and the medical school. Uh, that, that, that has always been the goal. Uh, and, and this year, the Global Health and Medical Ethics Program uh, is aiming at precisely that. Uh, with that background, I am delighted to introduce today's first speaker in the series, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Singer uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, Peter and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, in 1987-88, uh, when we were doing our third series on economics and healthcare, uh, Peter was here at the university uh, doing our fellowship program in medical ethics. Uh, after completing that, uh, he, he previously graduated from the medical school in Toronto. Uh, he went to Al Feinstein's program in Toronto, Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at Yale uh, for a couple of years, and then returned to his home in Toronto, uh, where he's been uh, since then. Uh, for 10 or 12 years, he directed the Joint Bioethics Center at the University of Toronto, which, by my count, uh, was the largest uh, bioethics program uh, in North America, or probably the largest one in the world, linking 12 hospitals in, in the city, uh, as well as all the schools at the University of Toronto. Uh, Peter uh, stepped down as director to focus on global health uh, about three years ago. He currently directs the McLaughlin Rockman Center for Global Health and remains a professor of medicine at Toronto. His current research focuses uh, on the developing world and how technologies can make the transition uh, from lab to village. Uh, uh, Peter's uh, CV is formidable, uh, 15 or 18 books and uh, 300 more peer-reviewed publications and the like. Uh, but he's served recently uh, as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, their program called Grand Challenges for Global Health, and he's also been an advisor to the UN Secretary General's Office for the NIH, for the Government of Canada, uh, on issues related to public health. Uh, his talk today is, is shown up above lab to village and life sciences, ethics, and commercialization help save the world. It's a delight to welcome Peter Singer back to the University of Chicago. Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. It's terrific, uh, terrific to be here. And it's uh, really a great honor to be uh, uh, introducing this fantastic lecture series. Um, I haven't been going to those uh, lectures or seminar series, Mark, that you've been holding for 28 years, 
but I do remember the one 22 years ago, and uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. And also uh, would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Siegler and the doctors Olapade uh, for the launch of this fantastic global health initiative. Uh, there's a launch event occurring at 4.30 uh, this afternoon, I think, to which you're all invited, and maybe a bit more on that, uh, on that later. But um, uh, let me just start uh, by doing a bit of housekeeping. In the, uh, in, in the uh, program, it says we're going to 1.30. Many of you in conversation say you're going to 1. We're very flexible, and we can do whatever you like, but we, it would be helpful to know. So raise your hand if you're planning on leaving at 1. Okay, and I ask this question before you even hear whether this is a great lecture or a terrible lecture, so you're not biased. And raise your hand if you're sticking around till 1.30, uh, conditions permitting. Okay, so what, we'll, what I'll try and do is I'll definitely end the talk well before 1, have time to begin the discussion before 1. Those of you who have to leave should leave, uh, and then uh, we'll have time to continue the discussion till, uh, up to 1.30 or as long as uh, those who choose not to leave would like to uh, continue it. You know, when you uh, title a lecture like this, uh, let me just ask this as a question. What do you think the answer to that question is? Yes. <laughs> I mean, in part, it's got to be a qualified yes, or else uh, one wouldn't entitle a lecture like this. And actually, that's the thesis I want to argue, uh, which is that uh, life sciences innovation, including the ethics and commercialization aspects, and uh, all the various forces that are needed to move life science technologies from lab to village, um, can certainly improve global health and, uh, and uh, uh, in part, help save the world. Uh, that really is the thesis that I'm arguing. So this particular talk is about uh, drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, medical devices, reaching the world's poor, as unfortunately they all too often don't, uh, as I'll show in a minute. But um, I want to start here with the context of global health. I think you're all familiar with uh, the statistics in global health that are often um, bandied about. Uh, you know, there are uh, about 15 million deaths, say, from infectious disease every year. Uh, that's disproportionately uh, deaths in the developing world. The big three, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, with malaria causing about 500 million cases and about a million deaths a year mostly children under five in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, TB with almost 10 million incident cases and 1.3 million deaths. And very frighteningly, the upsurge of five, uh, half a million cases of multidrug resistant TB. HIV with 33 million people infected, uh, 2.7 million new infections a year, and two million deaths. Uh, but on top of the big three, which are often talked about, are actually the more silent killers that uh, aren't talked about that much. That's pneumonia, killing about 2 million children a year, and diarrhea, killing about 1.7 million. And even beyond that, the neglected tropical diseases, schistosomiasis, onchocerciasis, and so on, which are truly the diseases of the poor, almost chronic infections uh, affecting a billion people a year, including 400 million children. And lurking behind all those infectious diseases are problems of infant and young child nutrition, like Jack the Ripper lurking in a, uh, lurking in a, in a, in a, in a hallway, because many of those uh, infections uh, often have poor infant and young child nutrition as an underlying cause. And then when you take that whole group of infectious diseases and killers uh, that disproportionately affect the poor, and you come to realize that actually there's more deaths in the developing world from non-communicable diseases, heart disease and cancer, than there are even from infectious diseases, although those deaths are a little more evenly distributed uh, in the developing world and the, and the industrialized world, you start to see what a huge problem this is in health terms. But I don't think we should look at it primarily in health terms or exclusively in health terms, especially not in a uh, series on uh, global health and medical ethics, I've actually come to see this uh, as a fundamental ethical challenge. You know, life expectancy in North America, 80 years and rising. In many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, 40 years and falling due to some of the issues we just discussed and others. 
And if that isn't the most significant ethical challenge in the world, or one of the most significant, I don't know what is. As Mark mentioned, I was working earlier on in uh, bioethics, um, end of life care, living wills, and it just dawned on me one day uh, that important as quality end of life care is, and it is extremely important. Um, you know, whether or not someone lives an extra week or two on in an intensive care unit in one of our hospitals is even less important a problem than this discrepancy in health outcomes around the world. So I think fundamentally we should see this not only as a health problem, but also as an ethical problem. And of course there's many political and economic and social issues underlying uh, these inequities in global health as well. And zeroing in on the focus of my talk, behind those inequities in, uh, in health outcomes, behind that uh, uh, global health challenge is something we've come to call the lab to village problem. Um, this is just picking out one example uh, of hepatitis B and hepatitis B vaccine. And the slide shows what uh, discrepancies you have in the uptake of this particular vaccine technology, although you could show this for many, many different types of vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, between the rich world and the poor world. So this is the uptake of uh, hepatitis B vaccine in industrialized countries. You know, the virus was discovered in 1967, the vaccine created in 1969, pretty widely available in 1982. I remember as an intern in 1984 having uh, hepatitis B vaccine, one of the last uh, hepatitis B vaccines that came from serum before the recombinant vaccine. You've got this huge uptake, but look at this flat line in developing countries. Even though most of the hepatitis B in the world causing primary hepatocellular carcinoma is actually in the developing world, in Asia, in parts of North Africa. So this lab to village problem uh, and this inequity and in uptake, if you will, of health technologies is partially behind, and I'm not saying exclusively behind because there's all sorts of other social determinants of health, corruption, macroeconomics, et cetera, behind it, partially behind this problem. And behind this lab to village problem, behind these inequities in health problems are inequities in knowledge and the uptake and distribution and use of knowledge, including knowledge of science of technology. And that's where I want to focus with you today. Um, so what are the uh, forces that influence whether a health-related technology, be it a new drug or a new vaccine or a new uh, medical device or an old technology for that matter, uh, uh, or a new diagnostic, reach uh, the global poor, reach those who need it in the developing world. This uh, is the path that uh, we've called from lab to village. And uh, it turns out that it's not a very straightforward path. Um, to answer the question of what forces influence, uh, what forces influence whether technologies go from lab to village, we did a qualitative survey um, that was published uh, here uh, in 2007, we asked almost 100 um, people from the developing world, from academia, from industry, from civil society, from government, that simple question. What do you see as the forces that influence uh, whether technologies go from lab to village? And uh, this uh, graphic represents a qualitative analysis of their responses. And essentially, I'm just going to focus on the inner circle. They said there were four major forces that influence uh, this process from lab to village. And again, you know, this isn't the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, but it is an organizing framework for understanding uh, the forces that can influence this phenomenon. Obviously, there's issues in science, and I'm going to come back to those. But uh, importantly, science is necessary but not sufficient. There's also some significant issues in ethics, society, and culture some significant issues in, in finance and commercialization, and some significant political issues. And that's going to be the framework of my talk. I want to just touch on some of those forces and talk about how they can be harnessed to actually influence whether technologies go from lab to village uh, to help address those health inequities that we saw at the beginning. So let me start first with science. Uh, I think it's fair to say that with some notable exceptions, yellow fever vaccine, et cetera. Usually, by the way, exceptions that involve military interests or 
or other uh, or travelers. With some notable exceptions, uh, discovery science in the area of global health and even development, you know, once you've got a lead compound and you're developing a drug or another uh, technology, um, was really lagging behind until about, uh, until about 10, 15 years ago when funders, including the Gates Foundation, started to pour significant investments into the area of science and global health. One of the first, probably the first, large-scale program on discovery science and global health was this Grand Challenges in Global Health Initiative. And so I want to use that as a bit of a focusing uh, mechanism. Um, and by discovery science, I mean upstream of the lead compounds uh, using the taxonomy discovery, development, and delivery. So this uh, Grand Challenges in Global Health, how many of you have heard of this or participated in it? So this was really a, a revolutionary piece in terms of science and global health. In about 2002, Bill Gates had the idea uh, that he would borrow a 100-year-old process uh, putting out grand challenges from a mathematician called David Hilbert, who about 100 years before put out grand challenges in mathematics. And he would put out this, hundred, this uh, grand challenge process, and then he talked to Rick Klausner, who was heading uh, the foundation at the time, uh, who then uh, brought in Harold Varmus and Elias Serhuni. And their initial challenge was, how do you define these grand challenges in global health? Through a series of meetings and a wide uh, set of requests right around the world, where they had thousands of ideas that came in, they uh, consolidated it down into 14 grand challenges around seven goals. That was 2003. What followed is $500 million of funding, to 44 discovery science projects. And we're now entering sort of the fourth to fifth year of the program. And it really has, I think, made a big difference in discovery science. Just to give you a few examples, um, one, of the, uh, one of the grand challenges has to do with uh, enhancing staple crops of the poor, like cassava, like sorghum, with micronutrients, like vitamin A, like, uh, like iron, and like zinc. Um, and so uh, at that time, there was the example of golden rice, but no examples of stack traits in staple crops for the poor. Rice, as you know, is eaten quite a bit in Asia, but, um, uh, but staple crops in Africa are uh, crops like cassava, sorghum, and maize. Four or five years later, uh, what we have now is actually stack traits with those three traits in those staple crops about to go to, uh, about to, go to field trials. So essentially, that grand challenge has had very significant progress and it's entering the development phase. Similarly, um, and, and I mentioned at the outset that the terrible plague of infant and young child nutrition and micronutrient deficiency lurking behind a lot of those infectious disease deaths. Here is a solution, not the only solution, but a solution, and we can talk about it in context uh, in the discussion. Similarly, one of the grand challenges was um, incapacitating vectors like mosquitoes so they don't transmit dengue and malaria. The science of that was not very far advanced four or five years ago. Now uh, we're at the point where at least three investigators around the world are ready to enter caged field trials with essentially genetically modified mosquitoes that don't transmit dengue or malaria. You know, uh, think about it as a malaria vaccine in terms of prevention. Uh, a malaria vaccine, but as an alternative, uh, almost vaccinating, if you will, the mosquitoes so they don't transmit malaria. Similarly, about half these Grand Challenge projects were on vaccines. Um, they were on uh, creation of new vaccines, and one of the projects actually has led to a, uh, a genetically modified plasmodium falciparum that can't make it out of the human liver. So using that as a live attenuated malaria vaccine to complement the other two vaccines that are a little further ahead in the pipeline, the RSS one, um, which is a subunit vaccine, and the, uh, and the uh, Scenaria live attenuated whole parasite vaccine. So you get a new malaria vaccine out of this. Similarly, a lot of the grand challenges were about um, improving existing vaccines, so they didn't need refrigeration 
which is where 80% of the costs are in delivery in, in, uh, in the developing world, or as I've come to learn most significantly, so they can be given only once. So imagine you are living, uh, you're a mother living in a rural setting in sub-Saharan Africa, and you have to go 100 miles to a clinic for vaccination, and you have to do that three times for simple childhood vaccines. Uh, like diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, et cetera. Imagine being able to do that just once. And imagine being able to engineer a vaccine that you could actually give to newborns when they're actually in contact with the health system anyway. These are the sort of advances that are coming out of some of those grand challenges. So without belaboring the point, I really just want to highlight that a lot has happened in the science, especially discovery science of, uh, of global health, even in the last five years. Now, as I mentioned, um, most, while most of the, uh, while there's a disproportion of infectious disease deaths in the developing world, most of the deaths in the developing world actually, especially when you're counting India and China, but also in some parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in, in, in urban settings, occurred due to chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And so this, uh, complementary program was launched that identified grand challenges in chronic non-communicable diseases. And as of a few months ago, six of the world's funding agencies, including NIH, that control 80% of the world's health research funding, have come together in a global alliance for chronic disease to mount uh, science initiatives uh, against, uh, against these problems. So on the science side, there's been a lot that's happening in, uh, in global health. But science, whilst necessary, is not sufficient to address the health problems I uh, highlighted at the outset. And um, there are some very interesting issues in ethics that come up as well, and I would like to talk about just a couple of them. We've been working with that Grand Challenges program with investigators and with uh, uh, program officers at the Gates Foundation more generally to try and uh, help them to address some of the ethical challenges they face in the actual conduct of, the, of their research. And I'd just like to highlight uh, a, couple of the, a couple of the issues that have come up. One of the, and, and by the way, these ethical issues do segregate, in my view, into a reasonably manageable group of four or five categories of issues, but I want to just highlight two of them. One is community engagement in research. On the top uh, left slide, you see the protests around uh, the tenofovir trials, the pre-exposure prophylaxis on HIV at the uh, Bangkok uh, AIDS meeting, I think around 2004, 2005. Um, these protests, which eventually shut down the trials in Cambodia and in Cameroon, of an incredibly promising drug uh, to prevent HIV transmission, uh, were related to the claims that there was insufficient engagement of the communities, in this case communities of sex workers, uh, on whom the research was being conducted. And um, so you can see that when these ethical issues aren't dealt with in an appropriate manner, and I'm not saying they were dealt with inappropriately here, you know, there's different sides to this particular story, but you can see that at least when they're perceived not to have been dealt with in an appropriate manner, very promising research that can have significant health benefits on an extremely important problem ends up being shut down. I want to contrast that perceived lack of community engagement on these tenofovir trials with this situation. This is a little um, research facility called Willendela outside of uh, Durban, South Africa. And this is a spot where uh, Salim and Karisha Abdul Karim HIV researchers in, uh, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal were invited in by the chief of the village about 15, 10, 15 years ago when the chief recognized that a number of the young people in his community for whom he was responsible were dying. And he wanted to understand why and he wanted to deal uh, with that problem through research. Through a series of trust-building um, initiatives with the community, this is a community that has really built up trust with researchers, and they're actually conducting very large-scale, NIH-funded largely, clinical trials, including uh, of tenofovir, uh, um, tenofovir gel as an intravaginal preventive prophylaxis for HIV transmission. 
a trial that we'll be reporting in about a year. So here you see tenofovir research with a perceived uh, inadequate community engagement shut down, tenofovir research with very good community engagement thriving. And this is Sue McRae, who's another one of Mark's uh, fellows, and you can see how engaged everyone is in this, uh, in this particular community engagement event at, uh, at Villandella. Now, if you like HIV research and you think community engagement is important, and if you follow what happened in terms of public engagement and community engagement in terms of GM food, you know, if you like what happened with GM food, you'll love what happens with GM vectors. At least the food just sits there on your plate. The vectors go buzzing around. It's like a B movie from the 1950s. So obviously community engagement in this sort of research, which I mentioned as a scientific matter on the previous slide, is really important. So what you've got is an investigator from the Grand Challenges, like Tony James, working very closely with bioethicists, much in the same way as Mark worked very closely with liver transplant surgeons in the late 1980s uh, around live donor transplantation, to select communities with whom to participate in research, to engage those communities, and so on. One of the caged field trials is going to be done in Tapachula, Mexico. Why? Because in that community, there's a lot of dengue. People see their kids dying of dengue. Um, they're already used to dengue control programs. They have um, the release of irradiated, uh, uh, irradiated fruit flies uh, already in that community for agricultural purposes. They've got good uh, civic structures with a dengue control committee that can engage with researchers. Um, you start to see how these sorts of mechanisms are critical to scientific research in the developing world and to making sure that the technologies actually reach people who need them. So just one of these ethical problems or issues is community engagement. And what I'm arguing here is that if you deal with it, if you don't deal with it, promising research doesn't happen and doesn't reach people, the technologies don't need, reach people who need it. If you do deal with it and there are evolving ways to deal with it, it's one of the forces that strongly influences the trajectory from lab to village. A second ethical issue, one that I find very, very interesting, is the issue of trust, particularly at the interface between the public and the private sector. If you went to a, um, many uh, schools of global public health around this country, and you did an MPH degree, you would probably leave with the impression that public sector action alone will solve some of the formidable challenges in global health. It's all about the role of government around the role of the public sector. There's no question that the public sector has an extraordinarily important role to play in global health. But I want to suggest to you that without the participation of the private sector, um, especially in this area I'm talking about, which is discovery and development and delivery of drugs, vaccines, and devices, but maybe even more generally, but let's just stick to this side and not the health system side, uh, that uh, we won't be able to tackle those problems in global health. So you will always come into conflict at the public-private interface, and at the heart of that conflict will be issues of trust. Take just one example I mentioned earlier of infant and young child nutrition. The evidence increasingly shows that um, what is needed in infant and young child nutrition is exclusive breastfeeding between zero and six months, continued breastfeeding at least until two years of age, but also the introduction of nutritious complementary foods at about six months. Because if you just breastfeed, you get into those micronutrient deficiencies I was talking about. If you think about that, Breastfeeding is sort of a public sector thing. It's actually more a personal thing than a public sector thing. But you don't want the private sector involved. And that takes us back to the whole conflict with Nestle dumping a formula, the WHO code of breast, uh, uh, breast milk marketing practices, and so on. And, you know, deservedly, food companies uh, uh, did bad things and deserved their bad rap. And that's the situation with breastfeeding. On the other hand, uh, those same food companies are increasing, are very unwilling to get into the game of delivering cheap, complementary foods that are nutritionally fortified to the poor. And if you think about where the poor get stuff to eat, sometimes it's home-based, for sure, home-based gruels and so on, which aren't always so nutritious. 
But often it's in those little market stalls in, 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 in slums. There's a lot of commercial activity. And uh, it would be great, I think, if there were cheap, affordable, nutritionally enhanced complementary foods uh, that could be available. So you need both public and private sector action to solve this nutrition problem. You need to have trust between them. And for the last 20 years, you could almost count on the fingers of one hand the time that public sector nutrition advocates and private sector uh, people sat down in the same room together because of the, the backdrop of the Nestle thing and the lack of trust. So arguably, I would argue, the critical barrier on the path to better infant and young child nutrition is overcoming this distrust between the public and private sector. And that distrust, I'm saying, was pretty well earned historically. How do you do that? You do that by talking about ethics and values, and you do that by showing that you're doing what you say you will be doing, and that's what this example shows. So this is the example of the Water Efficient Maze for Africa project. That's an agriculture, not a health project, but the 10-year goal in a public-private partnership is to, um, is to develop a drought-tolerant maize or corn crop that will be given royalty-free to African farmers. And who do, you think is, who do you think has all the technology to do this? Monsanto. Monsanto, the whipping child of GM over the past 10 years, is in the position where shortly it will be introducing drought-tolerant technologies to make your lawns and to make your agricultural fields better in the United States. And Monsanto itself has recognized that it doesn't want to be in the position of introducing those very profitable technologies in the United States whilst not providing those same technologies which could be so useful to food security in parts of the developing world. So joining with the Gates Foundation and the Buffett Foundation, uh, the foundation supported a $50 million project to enable Monsanto plus an African uh, uh, NGO called um, African Agricultural Technology Foundation plus Simit, the seed company, to join together to do this. So these are the sorts of things I think we'll see developing even more. Um, and I use this example because it really well illustrates the issues of trust, mistrust. How could a corporate bad boy like Monsanto now become the white knight, potentially, of agriculture? You know, thinking about climate change, climate adaptation strategies, this is it. They've got the technology. The yields can increase. What we're doing is doing social auditing. We are uh, interviewing almost a Nielsen panel of 100 people, not inside the project, outside the project, but knowledgeable about it. And the question we're asking is, look, here's the things that they said they would do. Provide it royalty-free to farmers. Play nicely with the National Agriculture Research Organizations in five countries, et cetera. Are they doing that? And we're providing an independent report card on the behaviors of this project and of Monsanto. And that's the trust-building exercise. So, you know, we'll probably go back and forth in the, uh, in the discussion period about this project. I often joke that uh, you couldn't have a more controversial project because it involves GM, Africa, Monsanto. The only way to make it more controversial would be to throw in the CIA. And as far as I know, the CIA is uh, not involved. But it's a good example of how an ethics challenge, namely the interface between the public and private sector and the ethical issue of trust, can be a critical barrier to global health, to global agriculture, and how things can be done to, uh, to build trust. The third area I want to talk about is called finance, um, which could probably be better called commercialization. So um, I've argued so far that to get from lab to, the getting from lab to village could have a very big effect on the health of the poor in terms of drugs, diagnostics, vaccines. I've argued that there's been really a renaissance or a revolution in discovery science in this area, but science is necessary and not sufficient. Interestingly, you face some pretty uh, uh, challenging ethical problems like community engagement, like trust at the public-private interface, and a couple of others we could talk about in the discussion period. But science and ethics is still necessary but not sufficient. Approaches to uh, commercialization are also needed, and I'd like to focus on a couple of those. Um, and think about this in the context of what you know. How many of you here have been involved in lab science? 
And you know that in the laboratory, there's a whole architecture of intellectual property, commercialization, the economic value of science, jobs. Think about what I'm about to say in that context. First place I want to focus is on the emerging economies, India, China, to a lesser extent Brazil, but I'm going to tell a couple of stories from India. And what I'm going to argue is that there are Indian companies, companies, domestic Indian companies, not generics companies, not branch plants of multinational U.S. companies, but domestic, generic, uh, domestic Indian companies that are innovating, producing affordable products, and making a contribution to the health of the poor. And um, here's a couple of examples. This is Shanta Biotechnics at Hyderabad. Remember I, told, I showed you that example of hepatitis B vaccine and how long it took to get from lab to village? In the late 1990s, the price of hepatitis B vaccine in India was about 25 bucks. What Shanta did was it took the recombinant process for hepatitis B vaccine, put it into a yeast called Pasticcia pastoris, uh, used that to create hepatitis B vaccine, and the um, uh, lesser degree of impurities plus the labor arbitrage in India, plus the competition among Indian domestic vaccine manufacturers made the price of hepatitis B vaccine go down from 25 bucks to, guess, less than a buck. So just think about what that does to access to hepatitis B vaccine if you're going from a $25 product to a $1 product. And that is because of innovation in the uh, biotech process. Not, you know, it's not Silicon Valley. It's a little innovation in process that leads to a huge uh, degree of uh, difference in affordability. Similarly, this is a company called Biocon uh, in Bangalore. Remember I mentioned uh, that non-communicable disease kill more people in the developing world than does infectious disease? Biocon makes affordable recombinant insulin and is one of the largest suppliers of insulin, especially affordable insulin, in the developing world. Think about out of one plus billion people in India with the changing dietary patterns, how much diabetes you have. Think about the insulin requirements and think about where that insulin is going to come from. And you see a company like Biocon making a, a big contribution. The Serum Institute of India. Um, how many of the vaccines in the world do you think are made by companies in the industrialized world versus the developing world? Of all childhood vaccines, where do you think childhood vaccines come from? All the childhood vaccines delivered in the world. Well, according to this company, and uh, you know, this is probably not far off, one out of every two childhood vaccines is made not just in the developing world, not just in India, but by the Serum Institute of India. So, you know, we don't often think about that, but that's a huge contribution to vaccines, a mainstay in global public health and affordable innovation. This is just to say that um, you also see some innovations on the health system side. Abhay Clinics um, developed a new rabies vaccine. It was an animal vaccine company. Rabies is in thousands of rural villages in India. How do you get the vaccine there? They set up a set of franchise clinics called Abhay Clinics uh, that help deliver this and other vaccines. Think about this as the McDonald's of rabies vaccine in India. So just to show, there's a lot of innovation in companies, especially in India and China, that can produce affordable products for the poor. And um, in the November, December issue of Health Affairs, uh, we're putting uh, forward a more in-depth analysis of this that documents tens of technologies that are specific uh, to um, neglected diseases that come from Indian, Chinese, uh, Brazilian, and South African companies. Sort of a proof point that there is a flow of a pipeline of technologies. And what we suggest is that this a source of innovation can be better tapped by helping these companies reach distant markets. So for instance, the CEO of Biocon would tell you it's pretty easy for her to make insulin and get it distributed in India. But getting it distributed in other parts of the developing world, she faces serious regulatory barriers and serious barriers that can be overcome. And the best case in point of this is a, a cholera vaccine developed by a, a company 
in China, owned by a, a company in the Philippines, um, that is probably equivalent to the multinational vaccine, much cheaper, and has trouble reaching uh, the places where it needs to go. So um, that's emerging economies and commercialization. And my main point is there's a source of innovation there that can be better tapped, uh, affordable innovation. But what about Africa? Here are some examples of technologies in Africa that we've called stagnant technologies. And the examples we've come across are um, Artemisia annua extraction for antimalarials, rapid HIV diagnostic kits, perethrium-based mosquito nets. We've come across many, many examples of technologies that are stagnant. They have been discovered and developed by African scientists, and there is a pretty vibrant um, a group of African scientists, mostly not in universities, mostly in research institutes in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, but are totally stuck in the laboratory. So, you know, your vision of Africa is probably a place bereft of science. Well, it's not a place bereft of science. It's actually a place with a pretty strong science culture in many African uh, research institutes. It's not Silicon Valley. These aren't killer applications but they are small innovations that are relevant to local problems. And what happens to these innovations? They get stuck, or as my colleague Abdullah Dar likes to say, they get constipated in these laboratories. Why? It's fundamentally a cultural thing, and that's what I'm going to show you on the next slide. So let me tell you a story of um, a malaria bed net manufacturer. I mentioned earlier that malaria kills uh, a million children under five, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa in the developing world. I mentioned, uh, we talked about malaria vaccine, we talked about uh, vector control and genetically modified mosquitoes, but the mainstay of prevention, as you know, for malaria is long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. And Mark, you know this very well, as you do in your family. You have to sleep under a bed net to prevent malaria. The long-lasting means that the insecticide is in the bed net and it will last for up to five years or over five years, even though the bed net is going through washes. This uh, company, the, oops, sorry, this company that you see on the left is called A to Z Textile Mills. It's in Arusha, Tanzania, and it is an amazing site when you go in. This is the largest manufacturer of long-lasting insecticide-treated nets in Africa. Uh, it's currently making about 15 million bed nets a year. It employs about 5,000 people. And it's really incredible. Every time I've gone back, they have a plant the size of a football field. And every time I've gone back, they've added a new football field, a manufacturing plant. It's just doubling and tripling. And when you go in, it all starts at one end with this little blue plastic pellet, which is then put into strings, into sheets, cut, turned into bed nets. So it's a fantastic example of African manufacturing. And where do you think that little blue plastic pellet comes from, which already has all the insecticide and innovation in it? Comes from the Sumitomo Chemical Company in Japan. So this is a great example of African-based manufacturing for health. It's a great example of corporate social responsibility from a multinational based in Japan. But when you ask these guys, do you know this guy, Wen Kalama, who for the same 30 years these guys have been working has been a vector scientist looking at the same scientific issues in the same country as these guys have been manufacturing? Uh, they say, no, we haven't heard of, heard of him. So what you've got is the same commercialization gap between science and, uh, between science and business in, or in this example and in many examples we've come across in sub-Saharan Africa, as you see here, in terms of how you're going to commercialize your discoveries, except it's a lot worse because people like Wen Kalama want to outdo the Oxford professors. They just care about papers in science and nature, not Wen in particular, but this is generally a, a something we found in the culture of African science in research institutes. More interested in that than getting their discoveries out. So um, very briefly, and I'm going to wrap up, what can you do about that? Well, you need to do the same sort of innovation platforms bringing together science, business, and capital as you see in the United States. Every block, you've got an a life sciences incubator. Uh, there's almost none 
in sub-Saharan Africa. So imagine an innovation platform that has a product development fund to bring to proof of concept, introduces uh, scientists and business people, and may even have a physical center with some infrastructure that's funded through public development finance institutions and where the technologies ultimately are funded by private capital. You know, we, couldn't identif we could identify virtually not a single dollar of invested life sciences venture capital in sub-Saharan Africa outside of South Africa. And for those of you in a lab, think about what that means if you're a young scientist. It means almost guaranteed that you'll never be able to take an idea that you have and turn it into a product that will end up on, on, on a market or a service that will end up on a market. And um, if you were to ask yourself, what would be the best way to make sure that developing countries stay developing forever, that poor countries stay poor forever, what would you do if that was your goal? What you would do is you would make sure that no domestic idea or innovation is turned into a product or service sold on a local market and exported. You'd make sure that the talent, the ideas of young people in those countries are wasted and not uh, harnessed in this way. And that is pretty well a description of what's happening in many sub-Saharan African countries. So turning this around is much more than an issue of saving lives and creating local uh, innovations. It's fundamentally an issue of development. And at a time when approaches to international development are being questioned, this is one approach, certainly not the only approach. You know, I'm not a scientific hegemonist or commercial hegemonist, but one approach that really ought to bear greater examination. We started to work with governments in uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, Ghana, Uganda, as the Vice President of Uganda, to try and um, implement some of these approaches. Um, and uh, we can go at this in the discussion period a little bit. But I think fundamentally bringing science and business together in sub-Saharan Africa is really a way for health and economic development to proceed. Very briefly, I'll just touch upon politics. This is Paul Kagame, the President of Rwanda, just to highlight that he gets that. And when he's talking about from dependency to self-sufficiency three years ago in a speech, he says, we in Africa must either begin to build up our scientific and technological training capabilities or remain an impoverished appendage to the global economy. So this is not the middle of the night when you see starving African children with big bellies and would you please donate and the other Peter Singer and my namesake and give 2% of your income. This is a different vision of addressing challenges in uh, the developing world and in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, which actually is very close to what you all do. So what I want you to start to think about is what you can do to participate in this, uh, what will become, I think, a revolution in knowledge in all parts of the developing world, including in Africa, and think about the linkages that you can make through the Global Health Initiative and in other vehicles to help accomplish this fact. This is not um, yourselves going with Habitat for Humanity to build houses. This is you taking the knowledge of PCR that you have and helping African colleagues develop PCR in their own laboratories and tackle their own challenges. So it's a very different vision of development that's very well suited to you. And by the way, when I talk about innovation, I'm not, even though most of my examples have been on science and technology innovation, talking narrowly about that. I think we also need to include social innovation and the sort of innovations that lawyers, managers, business people, health system delivery people, et cetera, uh, can accomplish in the path from lab to village. So just in closing then, how can innovation help? Developed countries can do things like grand challenges programs, emerging economies, affordable innovation, Africa harnessing its own talent and ideas through innovation centers, to get to this fundamental ethical ideal that every life has equal value. But when you look at the values of global health ethics that I want to return to just at the end of the talk, the most important one actually is not equity. The most important value probably is solidarity, especially in an economic crisis. Because it's only at the point when these two folks really care about what they can do for these folks. And I've talked a lot about how one might do that in this talk, that uh, the path from lab to village will become easier. Um, these are some kids I met on the east coast of uh, India. 
where um, uh, it's an Indian village uh, and you've got thatched huts and bare feet, but you walk in and there's a, uh, a kiosk hooked up to the internet in the middle of the village. And so the villagers are checking and the fishermen are checking the US Navy weather satellites. They don't go out and die in a storm. The farmers are checking the grain prices in a local market so they don't get ripped off. The youth are checking the employment opportunities as firemen 100 miles away so they can get jobs. And at the time of the tsunami, which affected this region, uh, this was the way villagers were warned. So there was a lot of loss of property, but not a loss of life. And what I want you to think about with this metaphor is if that can work for the last great wave of, information, uh, of technology, information and communication technology, it can also work for the next great wave, which we're all involved in, life sciences uh, and, and related technologies. And uh, that is how we can move on the path from lab to village and help make the world a better place. So I'd like to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Again, it's a great honor to give this inaugural talk um, and uh, invite, uh, invite some discussion. There's a, there's a launch of this uh, Global Health Initiative at 4.30, and its location is? Um, it's at the Knapp Center at 4.30 um, in, in, a, in a new auditorium uh, with one of the most stunning views uh, of the city looking to the north. And um, uh, Peter will be speaking uh, on, on a related but a different topic. Um, and Dr. Lapati and, and her husband Shola will be there to, to um, introduce the event. So everybody is encouraged to attend. Great. So thank you very much and look forward to your discussion and questions. Thank you. Please. to actually get that particular somewhat antiquated organization on board with the, this more modern thinking of public private partnerships. So I think everybody's struggling with uh, new approaches to development. Anyone here read De Bisa Moyo's book, Dead Aid? You know, that's probably the most crystallized version of how standard approaches to development may not be working. The United Nations certainly has had a role in that. Um, it did a good thing. Uh, about 10 years ago or eight years ago when it set these UN uh, Millennium Development uh, Goals uh, because it focused attention on a narrow group of goals and different UN agencies started working together. However, and this is to your point, if you look at those UN Development Goals, there actually is no science in them. In effect, they're trying to, um, I don't want to say, well, there's very little science and knowledge and innovation in those UN Development Goals. And if you look at the approaches of development agencies, such as the British Development Agency under Claire Short, a previous development minister, the pro-poor approaches tend to be anti-knowledge, anti-higher education, anti-elites. So there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. Um, and like usual, this isn't a matter of either or. You need those humanitarian approaches to deal with short-term humanitarian crises. With a billion people going hungry every night in the world, you need food aid, you need those human, but if you don't also uh, invoke knowledge and science approaches, there's no reason to think that 10 years from now you won't be in the same situation. To take the example of malaria, if all we did was ship bed nets, 10 years from now we'd still be shipping bed nets. If at the same time we developed a malaria vaccine, ways to block malaria vectors, 10 years from now, we might not be shipping bed nets or shipping as many bed nets. And that highlights the importance of balancing the short-term humanitarian approaches to deal with real humanitarian disasters with the longer-term knowledge-based approaches that arguably might be more sustainable. Two weeks ago, um, I was at a meeting with uh, uh, the high-level UN uh, types, including the Secretary General. And the Secretary General launched his biotechnology initiative. And the, um, you know, the thinking behind that was there's a lot of approaches to problems of disease, to problems of hunger, to problems of energy and environment, to problems of security that don't involve biotechnology. But among the suite of available solutions is biotechnology. So it doesn't make sense to unnecessarily exclude that.
And the purpose of this initiative was to start to think about how that can be dealt with in a cohesive manner, including across UN platforms, which is where you started your question. So um, that was just a way of really undermining, uh, underscoring, not undermining, underscoring the excellent point that, that you made in terms of development approaches, showing how these approaches really are complementary, it's short term and long term, and maybe showing a bit of um, hopefulness in how the global development system, including even the UN system, might be dealing with new approaches to development, which they're starting to call 21st century approaches to development, and such new approaches are sorely needed. Please. Excellent question, and I, I hinted at this several times through the talk, but I, I'm very glad that you've brought it out and have a chance to really underline it. So um, uh, if you just take the case of sub-Saharan Africa, there's about 50 plus, 53 countries or so in Africa. They're all different. Um, and uh, why did we pick the ones that we were working with, Ghana, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda? Because in these countries... Uh, firstly, you've got relatively stable governance. It's not always democratic, but sometimes it's democratic, as the peaceful transition to power of power in Ghana recently showed. Um, you've also got pretty good macroeconomic growth, especially before the economic crisis that's now coming back. You know, five, six, seven percent growth in a lot of these countries. Those are the conditions, and of course, a relative lack of corruption. Those are the conditions that you need. Stable governance, a pretty good macroeconomy, those are the conditions that you need before you can focus in on the microeconomy. Everything I'm talking about, bringing together scientists and business people, et cetera, that's a microeconomic play. I mean, your incubators here would not do so well if your governor were hypothetically corrupt, <laughs> if you had uh, <laughs> terrible economic growth, you know, those conditions matter. And so um, this is not a simple solution, and it's not a simple situation. Uh, but one practical thing one could do is actually focus one's efforts on the countries where those conditions um, do obtain to some degree. And I, I don't know if you feel that's an adequate response, but you're absolutely right to underline the importance of governance, to underline the importance of macroeconomic growth. A lot of the ideas I'm talking about, actually all the ideas I'm talking about, would not work so well in modern day Zimbabwe, wouldn't have worked so well in Cote d'Ivoire uh, during the Civil War, et cetera. So um, uh, just a very good and very worthwhile to bring out. The natural resource curse is a huge problem. Some countries have dealt with it pretty well, Botswana probably being a really good example with diamonds. Some countries have dealt with it less well. And some countries in Africa are very rich countries and what would make the most sense for them is to take their wealth from natural resources and invest it into knowledge-based uh, uh, knowledge ventures that create highly skilled jobs. Exactly the same thing we're trying to do in Canada. So, you know, you don't often think about these parallels, uh, but they're really, uh, they're really there. Please. Yeah, I'm curious about the response of the, uh, the peoples in these areas to the genetically modified uh, uh, therapies and approaches. I know in Europe, that is pretty much universally sort of almost reflexively frowned upon. So yeah. is there a similar kind of uh, feeling or thoughts? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and, and it's not distinct because um, some African agricultural exports go to Europe, so regardless of what the uh, uh, regardless of what the domestic thinking is, they could have problems with their exports. Um, secondly, 
uh, there are, is engagement of people with a diversity of views uh, through the media with local people in many of the countries I mentioned. So it, there's not exactly a, a clean wall between views in Europe, views in the United States, and views in Africa. Having said that, you know, I think the views are um, complex. People, the, the main response is people have never heard of them. And then when you start to explain what, uh, what, um, what the organisms, what uh, GMOs are, and particularly, uh, you know, starting with uh, what benefits they can bring, what risks they might have, what they are, people come along that path as any rational person would. A as you know, there's relatively little evidence, or maybe no evidence, of harm to human health from GMOs. There's a billion people that are hungry. And so you're balancing hypothetical risks and benefits in an interesting way. And the one place I'd end this response is what is totally clear is that it shouldn't be European civil society organizations dictating what Africans ought to be thinking about GMOs when um, you've got uh, famine in various parts of Africa. So for instance, in 2002 or 2004, when the president of Zambia refused US food aid, uh, because it was genetically modified. And uh, the local um, Zambians who were hungry attacked the grain facilities so they could get access to that grain. That tells you something about how people balance uh, priorities. Having said that, um, I think what is really needed is a good, honest discussion of what it is, what the benefits are, what the risks are. And that discussion is starting to take place not only on the part of farmers, but also on the part of consumers. And maybe w the one thing we would all agree about is that those are decisions that need to be made um, uh, by African countries and by Africans themselves, not by outsiders telling Africans uh, what their views ought to be. And just one little piece I've noticed that is connected here is if you've actually got a local scientist doing work on well, any biotechnology actually, doesn't have to be GMOs, and that scientist can talk to uh, his or her uh, country, people, con uh, country people about the science, about its benefits, about its risks. That's a much more robust and healthy play than a scientist from Hopkins going and telling people about the particular technology. And so there's this very important link between trust in the science, between community engagement, and between the building of local scientific capacity. What's the Latin yeah. phrase, Cus, custodius custodiant? Who's guarding the guardians? Uh, I think there is a fair question that can be asked about the accountability of transnational NGOs um, that uh, have the sort of discourse that you're talking about. Having said that, the role of civil society is so important that one wouldn't want to suppress it. But I think there's a fair question that can be asked about the role of transnational civil society organizations, just like one fairly asked questions about the role of transnational corporations. Um, and I think what's underlying the GMO debate, which is really what you're hinting at, is a lot of uh, fears and feelings about globalization, about corporate dominance, especially on the part of US multinationals. To some extent, those fears are well-founded, um, but those do underlie that debate. What can be done, was your question. I think the simplest thing that can be done is to really engage scientists in the developing world, uh, especially in Africa. And I, the reason I say especially in Africa is, believe me, <laughs> the Indian and Chinese scientists and companies don't need much help from us. Having sat on the scientific board of a Chinese venture capital fund, I can assure you uh, that they're fine, and they'll be teaching us stuff pretty soon. Um, uh, but the, uh, you know, especially in Africa, to, to really engage um, local capacity, local scientists, young people, and build up the science. Because it's only when a society has its own domestic science and the companies and commercialization to which that science leads that a society really values that science. So any intermediate position of sending vaccines from Indian companies into Zimbabwe or what have you has to be seen as an intermediate position. And the ultimate place in the path from lab to village, in my view, is when the lab is in the village. Because that's the point at which we're not going to have a divide between a developing and a developed world. But it's not enough for the lab to be in the village, which is the standard science capacity building mantra 
of the last uh, 10, 20 years, that lab also needs to be able to commercialize its products because um, it's that process of innovation, which is not just science and technology, but also commercialization, that leads to companies, that leads to jobs, that leads to economic development, that leads to people being able to solve their own problems. And that's what needs to happen at the end of the day. Sure. I mean, in your travels in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, can you comment on the importance of uh, environmentally friendly energy source uh, instead of biomass as a way of improving global health or sustaining some of this uh, innovation and participation between the local uh, uh, community and uh, technology? Yeah, so... Um, you know, I've focused, if, if you think about the sort of challenges that the world faces, it faces challenges of military conflict, it faces challenges like the type we were talking about, but a lot of the challenges it faces are amenable to knowledge, particularly in the domains of health, agriculture, and energy and environment. I've focused particularly in the area of health with a couple of forays into agriculture. We could have had that same discussion in energy. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned the grand challenges in global health. There was another grand challenges exercise conducted by the National Academies in the U.S. where one of the grand challenges was cheap solar energy. If you think about how much sunshine there is in Africa, yeah. that's a perfect place for the development of cheap solar energy as opposed to the use of coal-fired plants imported from China contributing to global warming. At the uh, U.N. meeting I was at a couple of uh, weeks ago, that was not about health and biotechnology. That was about biotechnology helping the UN address its challenges that it's dealing with in health, in agriculture, in energy, and environment. And one of the most interesting discussions was actually around the role of algae and biotech-modified algae as an energy source, as a clean energy source. So there's a lot of... Um, uh, there's a lot of potential in the areas of agriculture, and I think especially in the area of energy and environment, and that might be an entry point for uh, uh, developing countries. And maybe the last thing I'll say is, when you think about these innovation platforms that I mentioned, which, by the way, are in the strategic plan now of the African Development Bank. So the African Development Bank says now that when it thinks about infrastructure, it's not just bridges putting one side of a river in touch with the other. It's also um, thinking about, they call it centers of excellence, but when you read it, it's really like these innovation platforms putting in touch science and business communities and joining them. Those innovation centers are probably best not focused on a particular problem or technology, but as a source more broadly for innovation and changing a culture of innovation in a country, in health, in agriculture, and in energy and environment, which you bring up, which is so important, especially with respect to climate change. Thank you so much. We'll take one more question. One more second. I, I do want to recognize three people who did so much to help put together this entire series and, and, and today's session. Virginia Corbett, the back row, and Maggie Costa, three years ahead, and in front of them, Janine Kim, working with Global. Please, yes. That's controversial. So, um, uh, and particularly that involves the public and the private sector. Right. So, you know, social auditing has a very robust history, particularly in the environmental movement. Um, it also has its critics of people who see it as a bit of a sham. But what that social auditing in the WEMA project is, is it's the first example of the application of social auditing principles to a large scale project in agrobiotechnology in Africa. And so what I would say is that I do think it should be a part of any potentially controversial public-private partnership in health, agriculture, or energy. I would also say that this interface between the public and the private sector um, admits of a whole suite of solutions. It's not just social auditing. I mean, there's, you, th the types of things that would help in the nutrition space or the agriculture space Codes, shared codes of values. Remember about 10, 15 years ago, um, Richard Smith, 
uh, from BMJ published his paper on a shared code of ethics for everyone. So you shouldn't have a code of ethics for doctors and one for physiotherapists and one for nurses. Um, well, similarly, you could have a shared code of ethics for the public and the private sector players in a problem. Uh, rankings of companies. Last year, a Dutch group released a ranking of pharmaceutical companies in terms of access to medicine, and there's in place uh, in play the development of a ranking of food companies in terms of uh, access to nutritious food on a global basis. Um, social auditing is a piece of the puzzle. Multi-stakeholder platforms. If you think about the multi-fiber agreement and how conflicts have been dealt with at a country level in terms of uh, uh, labor uh, law infractions and cheap labor, um, child labor in the developing world, uh, there are multi-stakeholder platforms where you've got a government official, someone from a union, someone from a company, who as a team would go investigate and arbitrate, um, investigate and arbitrate uh, uh, alleged abuses. And other multi-stakeholder platforms, you know, maybe the one most useful thing that could happen is to set up a process where a food company could actually take a proposed complementary food and the marketing materials related to that food to a multi-stakeholder platform and say, how does this look to you? Do you think this violates the WHO code of marketing practices for breast milk? Get a thumbs up, a thumbs down, and then if it is a thumbs up, that that group would then be willing to stand by that food company when they get uh, attacked um, and when their brand gets dis besmirched in the poor markets and affects them in the rich markets, and that would help the entry of those companies in those problems. So in summary, I think that social auditing is a, is a worthwhile uh, thing to test in controversial public-private issues, but there's a whole suite of potential solutions to deal with what is fundamentally an ethical problem, trust between the public and the private sector, where those groups need to interface for a broader social goal, because you do need the private sector to solve the problems in in, 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 uh, in global health. And let me just say that in many parts, that trust is well earned. I don't know if you saw the recent BBC report linking uh, the farm from which Nestle was taking some of its milk even in the last year in Zimbabwe with um, the, 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 this is a farm that had been overtaken um, by uh, Grace Mugabe and owned by Grace Mugabe and uh, a previously dispossessed farm that had been overtaken. And so, I mean, you know, in many cases that trust is well, uh, that mistrust is well earned, but we need to find ways to address that and build trust if we want to solve some of these big challenges in global health and global I, challenges more generally. I, I wonder if much of what you say would not find application in, um, in underserved urban areas, not so in Canada, but in this country. In terms of the private-public relationships, community engagement, uh, yeah. trust building, uh, I mean, well, these are things that are not only applicable yeah. to Africa. I'm really glad you mentioned that because uh, it actually does affect Canada. We had a, a meeting on uh, about a week ago uh, with our equivalent of the Institute of Medicine on um, uh, Canada's strategic approach to global health, and the one thing there was really clear consensus on is how Canada deals with the health of Aboriginal peoples oh, yes. is an important proof point in terms of its legitimacy uh, for any efforts in global health. And I think that's really the case. And, and in preparation for this talk, and I'll make some more comments about this at the 4.30 uh, talk, I started thinking actually about the University of Chicago in the context of the south side of Chicago and Hyde Park and the community that you're in, uh, how uh, to some degree the university has been reaching out over the years in those uh, community efforts. I mean, you, you know much better than I the success of those efforts. Um, but what I would say just to this uh, point is that this is an important proof point for you. And, it, you know, so a global health initiative at the University of, of Chicago, um, in part, the legitimacy of that relies on... Um, how the University of Chicago has also engaged with its local communities, even before you get to the public-private issues. So I think that's a very astute. The risk of that position is um, all of a sudden global health is domestic health, global health is everything, it's unfocused, and therefore it's nothing. So there's risks of going down that road as well. Um, but I think in some sharp ways there is some legitimacy to be gained by how we uh, work with local communities um, at the same time as we're thinking about how we work with the global poor.
Well, I very much want to thank you for, for leading off as the keynote speaker. Uh, it, it is our hope that, that all the other talks uh, among the 24, 25 to follow will be of this caliber. It's also my hope that I'll be able to serve office lunches if you don't spread the word too widely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and next week we will be in H103. Uh, I have actually seen um, a slide set in the text of Peter's 430 talk, uh, which I, I told him uh, is really quite fascinating and quite different from, from this talk. I want to thank you tremendously. Thank, thank you. you.